I, I, we are not cooking tonight, <laughs> so I hope you will not be disappointed now. Okay. Hi, Mark. Are we talking in English? <laughs> We're going to go, um, we have a chronological question and answer here. Um, so we've known each other, I, it's more than 20 years. More. Yeah. yeah. Um, and when we met, you were, actually you were 30, you were energetic, you were already pretty iconoclastic. <laughs> you were clearly destined to do things that were more interesting than open a couple of great restaurants, which is what you started by doing. Um, you were inspired and affiliated with the mad genius Ferran Adria at the beginning, and I say that affectionately, of course. But I don't think a lot of us know about your early life and what drew you to food, and especially to creative food. So can you tell something about that? Yes, Mark. I mean... Uh... I mean, number one, I mean, because this is like very raw. Like we're right here, he asked me a question and, and like you don't know how fascinating it is for me to be here with all of you in Chicago, in a city I came first time almost 30 years ago and I didn't know anyone. To be interviewed by, by a man who I knew who this man was because who he was in the food world and now being here with restaurants in Chicago, with many people in the audience now, I call friends, being next to this man, for me, is giving me the chills. So thank you to you, Mark. Thank you for all of you. And, and my life probably no any different than every one of your lives. At the end, all our lives in magical ways are the same. And, and I realized that I became who I became, probably you will agree with me, on who you are becoming, who you are, thanks to the people that always was around us every moment of our lives. Even people we forgot, but that nonetheless were important in who we became. I have plenty of those people in my life that they invested their time, their effort, their love, in making me who I am. And this goes for every one of you. And I hope, yeah, you can clap. <laughs> we don't charge for clapping at the Humanities Festival. <laughs> She's my type of person. <laughs> and for me, um, I never had uh, the best relationship with my mom or my dad. Um, not to their fault or to my fault, I believe, life. You know when sometimes you realize that nothing comes with instructions? <laughs> you tell me when I became a father and I'm looking like they're my wife giving the baby, I'm like, what are the instructions? <laughs> Look here, the baby crying in my arms. I'm like, holy sick, how do, how do I handle this thing? But it's the same to becoming a husband or a wife, in my case, a husband but the same becoming a boyfriend, or the same becoming just a boy, or, or becoming a chef. But in a way, with what I told you with the relationship with my family, at the end, I am everything I am because I had a fascinating woman that, and a, uh, as a mother, and a fascinating man as a father. That they were not perfect, but I realized I'm not perfect either but they had amazing things that made everybody around them always feel welcome. And my mom was a very early influence in my life in cooking, Mark, in a way that now I'm realizing what that influence was, which my mom was a nurse. My mom became a nurse pregnant of my fourth brother because she had to bring a new salary home to be able to pay the bills. Pregnant of my fourth brother and being a mom Working mama home, she carried the family forward, became a nurse, studying hard. My mom was really, and on top of that, Monday through Friday, she would be the one in charge of feeding people, my brothers and I. My father was more the weekend. Everybody helped, though. 
And my mom, at the end of the month, when there was never anything left in the fridge, it looked like if you went to Best Buy to buy a fridge and you open, oh, so beautiful, <laughs> empty. That was the commercial of my mom. But she will always find the half egg that was boiled dry, that the poor egg was almost with a signal there saying, please save me. <laughs> the, 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 the little piece of dry chicken from the roasted chicken from two weeks before that the steel was there saying, what is going on? Please eat me away. And she will get the chicken and the egg and she'll chop it and she'll make a bechamel with flour and, egg, and, and milk and she'll add all this chopped whatever leftovers were in the kitchen and she'll make croquetas that she'll roll in the breadcrumbs of the old bread of the last month using the coffee grinder. And I can believe right now today, those croquetas that came from my brothers and I, um, a message of love, home, anytime I went back, what do you want, croquetas? I cannot believe I'm charging people now for croquetas now. <laughs> So this, in a way, was very important for me. On top of my father, the weekend cook, inviting everybody, never keeping a, a list of who he invited and said yes, meaning 10 people could come or 40, because my father was very generous in feeding the many. And my mom would be always, come on, what happened if everybody comes? My father always said, big problems have simple solutions. If more people come, we add more rice to the paella pan. So you see, between my mom maximizing the power of feeding a family almost with nothing, uh, almost like multiplying fish and loaves now that we're in a church. <laughs> yeah. And the power of my father used to take any problem in a very relaxed way. But nonetheless, always been in a strange way successful. This early on was more important in my life than I realized even until recently. And that was, in a way, my early culinary days. Yeah. Nice story. I have other stories, but I'm gonna leave them at that. <laughs> um, I wanted, before we start talking about World Central Kitchen, which is probably what most people here want to hear about. I thought I might give you an opportunity to talk about another important thing from a few years ago called DC Central Kitchen, which tracks very nicely with how you've started and where we're going, so. Well, uh, again, he's asking me the question, but he knows the answer. <laughs> no, no, under my perspective, but under his perspective, because he's been part of that organization or other organizations in New York and across America. But DC Central Kitchen became a very important part also of my life. For the ones of you who don't know, I was in the Spanish Navy. And I was cooking for the Admiral, and I was like, really? I am in the Spanish Navy, and I have to cook for the Admiral in his house? <sighs> I want to go on a boat. I knock on the door, even everybody told me I couldn't tell the Admiral anything, and I didn't tell him anything. I only told him, wouldn't be nice that you that enjoy my cooking so much that other sailors will be able to enjoy the same cooking you are enjoying? This was a way for me to tell him, I'm very happy to cook for you, but I wanna go on a boat. <laughs> I went on a boat, and I traveled the world. And first time I visit Africa, and first time I visit Latin America and the Caribbean, but for me, it was the first time I visit um, the United States. Um, I came to a city called Pensacola. <laughs> a city that was celebrating the five flags. You need to understand, the ship I was on was not any ship. It was the ship. Four mast, beautiful white boat, sailing tall, ship boat, but like a movie. Arriving to Pensacola with the Blue Angels, the Navy um, planes, uh, pilots, just flying above the boat with the white beaches of Pensacola 
and then realizing that the five flags, one of them with permission of the Native Americans that were, didn't have any one of those flags, but one of the flags was the Spanish Castilian flag. They're like, holy shit, sure I belong here. <laughs> I'm sorry. We, we, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic, we, you know, Sundays we ask for forgiveness and boom. <laughs> so, I'm only a few hours a sinner, that's all. Um, but I'm telling you this story because for me it was important because it was the moment of belonging. Um, you know, yes, we arrived um, with permission of the Native Americans and the Vikings. We arrived like almost 100 years before all the British. Sorry, but it's true. Yeah. And where we arrive, the food is always much better than anywhere the British arrive. <laughs> I mean, this is off the record, but it's true. Everybody knows it. But this was an important moment in my life because it was the moment I understood. I arrived in New York. Lady Liberty, Ellis Island. Uh oh. And that's the moment that watching that Lady Liberty with what it's all about. I'm watching Ellis Island, understanding the meaning of Ellis Island for immigrants like me that I didn't thought about coming back to America, but everything began in a way creating the DNA inside me of I want to be part of this without realizing. I finished the military service. I came back, in case there's any immigration officer in the house, I came with a visa, legal. <laughs> <laughs> this happens sometimes. And I came back to New York. I became a cook in New York. Before realizing I landed in 1993 in Washington, D.C., I opened my first restaurant. We've, we are celebrating 30 years uh, this year, Haleo, which now we have one in. And long story short, I realized that restaurants like mine are very important to create communities. Because people like you join us, and we all create uh, a place to all of us to belong. We create community. But very quickly, I understood that in restaurants like mine, that we feed the few, we wouldn't really be successful if we then were part of other organizations that were in the business of feeding the many. And this is when This is Central Kitchen came into my life. I began volunteering. This is an organization that does amazing things, more than 35 years open, founded by a guy called Robert Egger, a guy that was a bartender, and uh, the guy that saw that we were wasting food. So he was ahead of anybody talking about wasting food. But he was ahead of everything else in the sense of when we waste food, we don't really waste food. What we do is we waste people's lives. And this guy told me that, I was 23, 24, that philanthropy seems is always about the redemption of the giver. When philanthropy must be about the liberation of the receiver. And in that place, the same lessons that my mom was teaching me on making croquetas with nothing. I began sharing that same knowledge to men and women that this is Central Kitchen was ringing coming out of the streets, people that were homeless, American-born, Washingtonians, but somehow they didn't belong to a city. Me being an immigrant, I already was kind of belonging in a way more than them, or at least I was experiencing a better life than all of them. This organization began taking people out of the streets, out of coming out of Yale, training them to be cooks, paying farmers that they were about to throw food away, but somehow making some money out of food was about to be wasted. Bring in the food, bring in the people, bring in a very powerful idea, let's then feed the homeless of the city. All with one dollar. One dollar to give hope to people, one dollar to train people, one dollar to rescue food is about to thrown away, one dollar then to find them jobs in restaurants like mine. And there I am not only sharing my knowledge next to hundreds of other chefs in the city, but in the process, those men and women were also teaching us lessons about the meaning of belonging. Not like they were in the street, that men, they felt they belonged less. They only were never given the same opportunity I was given. 
That organization changed my life because, in a way, showed me the power of food to really stop throwing uh, money at the problem, stop giving the crumbs to the hungry, but actually investing in true solutions that, in a fascinating way, has shaped what Washington, D.C. is still with the problems we may have where we were all part of the community, it was not us versus them, it was, again, we, the people, together, trying to solve the problem, one plate of food at a time. That's what DC Central Kitchen did for me. I realize now I don't have to actually ask questions. I could just say, like, <laughs> one word. <laughs> Um, but seriously, let's, let's, let's move on to World Central Kitchen, which is, I, I mean, I do know this story, it's true, but not everybody here knows this story. And the, the beginning of World Central Kitchen is another fascinating okay. tale. Um, so, so the beginning of the story is not really the moment we began with World Central Kitchen, but came way before. Came in moments like when I read John Steinbeck, and I understood in Grapes of Wrath that even in the richest country in the world, seems was a love inequality. Reading the Pearl, I mean, I love Steinbeck. He's quick, short, I understood his English. <laughs> and I felt like, yeah. Um, moments like when I was in the military service in that tall ship going to Rio Janeiro or to Abidjan in Ivory, Ivory Coast, and seeing that, well, maybe there was also poverty in Barcelona, the city I grew up. I never saw what I saw in Ivory Coast, in Abidjan, or in the favelas in Rio Janeiro, or outside the uh, Dominican Republic. And that began also as a young boy, kind of, wow. Even in the places I think the may not be hunger. Here we have people that are going through. Uh, obviously, all of that had a lot to do with my involvement with DC Central Kitchen. But then slowly but surely, certain things began happening. Uh, obviously, the lessons learned in DC Central Kitchen, I became the chairman of the organization, of the board. I'm still very involved with that organization to this day. Um, but they began seeing that things were happening and food and water was an afterthought. And I always thought that if it's a universal human right that should be food and water should be available to all. Maybe because I was a young Catholic boy that in religion class, obviously, becoming a cook. For me, Jesus was like the coolest, right? This guy, you give him some fish and some bread and the guy feeds everybody. I mean, we are over in the restaurant business if we have many guys like him. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. But in a way, I remember watching Katrina, New Orleans. Poor communities in the low nine, forgotten. Tens of thousands of Americans, in a way, in a very big catastrophe, forgotten. But even if we didn't take care of everybody, was those moments that are very big in my mind, when thousands of Americans went into the Superdome, an arena. An arena that, if you think about it, it took days, if not over a week, to bring food and water to the people in that arena. Things were, terrible things were happening inside that arena. You know what an arena and a stadium is? If I ask you, everybody will say, yeah, it's where I go to see my NFL team or my NBA team or, or my favorite musician, but everybody is wrong. An arena, a stadium, is a gigantic restaurant that entertains with sports and music. <laughs> when I go to the baseball stadium, everybody's eating hot dogs. I don't see anybody watching the game. Nobody seems to be able to hit the ball, God's sake. And that moment for me, I watched in the comfort of my home, in action. And it's the moment that I began really thinking, oh my God, can we do more? 
Then we saw September 11 in New York. Random, fascinating moments of citizens that were trying to help by just putting a grill outside the restaurant or just by opening the, the doors and just making some meals to anybody that will need the meal. Not an organized effort, but random, powerful efforts of empathy. So when I began putting all this in my brain, I'm like, wow, I think my profession that we feed the few, we can feed the many, if we all come together. For me, it was very important, 1996, 97. One across the street of my restaurant, Haleo, a brick, a red brick building was kind of reopened because they were doing construction and they found the belongings of a person. Seems the belongings of a person that had somehow her office and her bedroom. And that's the woman that worked during the civil war in the flying hospitals. The hospitals behind the front lines taking care of the wounded. And this is the woman that created the missing soldier's office when the Civil War ended trying to bring home um, closing to the families that lost loved ones in that Civil War. And the woman that created the Red Cross in America. The woman was Clara Barton, a nurse nonetheless like my mom. A woman that put at the service of others that she could be healing the few, but she decided to create organizations that she could be healing the many. In emergencies or in any situation, if you have to stop a fire, you send firefighters, I began thinking. If you have destruction in an earthquake, you send search and rescue teams. If you need to heal the wounded, you send nurses and doctors. But if you have to feed people in an emergency, who do you think would be the best prepared people? With that simple idea, I was in Cayman Islands, with those moments of inaction, but only dreaming of what we could do, still watching the people that were feeding around the world in difficult circumstances through UN and World Food Program and others. Haiti happened in 2010. Destructions, hundreds of thousands of people died. Hundreds of thousands of people lost their home. And I was watching in Cayman Island in the TV with my friend Eric Rippert, and but then, uh, Anthony Bourdain, uh, and that moment I said, you know, I'm not going to watch more in the comfort. I'm going to go not to help but to learn. As soon as I could, a few days later, a few weeks later, I got on a plane, I landed, I arrived to Haiti, I began cooking in a couple of camps, and that's the moment my learning ship began in how cooks like us we could be very important in emergency relief. That's how World Central Kitchen began on that early 2010 earthquake. Uh, and from there, we began dreaming. What else we could do as the organization slowly began learning and began adding more team members and more volunteers. That was the beginning of World Central Kitchen. <laughs> I was going to go to more stories, but I'm waiting for you to ask me the, Just, it's the, the question of the next story. We're going to the same place. So um, I would ask about, I mean, I would ask specifically about Puerto Rico and Ukraine, but there may be other things you want to talk about. But people do want to hear about the work, I'm sure. Yeah, we can. Obviously, now the missions are many that World Central Kitchen has been involved in the last... 14 years very much since we, we created it. Um, um, we began mainly in Haiti, we began in the limbo, in the edge of disaster and uh, development, you know, disaster and, and, and use long-term humanitarian relief. But very slowly, we began responding in the same Haiti to some hurricanes, to some earthquakes, even at, at that very light scale to compare to what we do now. We went, yes, from doing a few thousands, sometimes even tens of thousands with very little. And when the organization very much was me and one more person, 
the person running it. And when the funding came used for the money, I was racing through my restaurants. But we began learning, and we began doing certain things that I think were very powerful. Some schools in the most remote areas in, in, in Haiti, some uh, changing some schools from charcoal cooking to uh, clean uh, cooking with gas. Um, um, a school to cook in a school to teach women how to cook with those cleaner cooking to try to move them away f from charcoal. Projects that became important for me because in a way I was trying to bring to the rest of the world the lessons I learned in this central kitchen. But then Houston coming happened. That was Irma, Houston was Irma. And I went there with a team of few chefs, friends that came with me. And we did a kitchen in the convention center, we helped in the convention center. I'm not gonna get into dramatic stories that happened there. Um, children's hospital, we partnered with a couple of schools, one synagogue, a couple of churches, and we began feeding out of those places not only the people inside Houston, but people out in the surrounding areas that usually are the people that are always forgotten. And when I finished the mission there, after a couple of weeks, right there, 10 days later, Maria hits Puerto Rico. Category five, the hurricane crosses slowly but surely across the middle of the island. And whatever we read cannot do justice to the disaster that was unfolding. So I was able to land uh, with, with who then become the CEO, uh, one, the third CEO of World Central Kitchen, my friend Nate. And we landed. And in a way, Houston was very important in the shape of what World Central Kitchen became. But then Maria was the moment that we said, that's what we are doing from now on, and we are never going to stop, which was simple. In, in the worst moments of humanity, the best of humanity shows up. Like I saw in September 11, right in Manhattan, or even in Washington DC when the plane hit the Pentagon. But what people want is to give an opportunity to be able to help. And where the bigger organizations are not keeping you away. Because who is better than the locals to help the locals? Not every local can, because when a hurricane hits, you are in distress. People are looking for family members. People are trying to survive. People are trying to repair the roofs. So it's important that teams come from the outside. But very quickly, you see that it's always locals that are willing and able to help. And what we began realizing is that if we could empower those, we have the biggest army of goodness that we could build. So in Puerto Rico, when I arrived, I sent a text message not knowing if my friends will be able to read it. What's up? With a simple message, I'm coming. Those very simple words from a chef to chefs mean something very important. If you are coming and you are a chef, where are you coming? You used to write a book? No. <laughs> you're coming. You're coming to help and you're coming to start feeding. I met a chef, which is like my brother called Jose Enrique, who already was trying to fix his restaurant with a generator even when he didn't even have any gas or diesel to run it. And in that first day, two days after the hurricane, we were doing 1,500 meals, more or less. We went from 1,500 meals to 150,000 meals a day. We went from one kitchen to 34 kitchens. We, went, we got 10 food trucks that then became 20 all across the island. We were able to empower indirectly schools to open their kitchens with whatever food they had to feed their communities. At the end, we did almost 4 million meals, even I could say we influenced many more million meals. At the end, what I saw is that cooks, we were the best prepared people to help in an emergency. Why? Because everybody always asks me, and Jose, where do you get the food? Well, in the same place I get it when Everything is right. In the food warehouses, in the food companies, it's always food around. It's always a restaurant somewhere. It's always people willing to join forces to start feeding. It's always people willing to drive their four by fours to deliver to remote areas. It's always a helicopter pilot that doesn't know what to do but wants to help. 
and the only thing you say is, join us. We went to Ukraine, two people were sent to a kitchen. Before we knew it, on the first 24 hours we were feeding already, in a week we were feeding in every border, city in Poland, as Ukrainians were living. Before we realized we were in every country surrounding Ukraine as refugees were living. Before we knew, we were also in Germany and in France. But at the same time, we went inside Ukraine and we were in Lviv. And we arrived in Kyiv when still the Russian troops were trying to break the defenses of the city. Before we realized, we went from again 1,000 meals the first day to more than 1.5 million meals a day in Ukraine. We've done more than 240 million. And we did it using creativity, um, using restaurants. More than 500 restaurants joined us. We were able to support them because especially American people were always very generous with us. And thanks to that generosity, we were able to put that money in real time at the service of providing relief, who we were feeding. Um, we built two kosher kitchens of people, of, of, of Jewish people living in Ukraine and in the middle of the war. We were feeding churches, we were feeding refugee uh, centers, we were feeding kindergartens that they were trying to use their kindergarten to host as many families as they could. Millions of Ukrainians were living the horrors of war. At the same time, we were feeding in the front lines. Uh, in this war, we lost in Ukraine six World Central Kitchen volunteers out of two missiles hitting the bunker where they were sleeping. We got few kitchens destroyed, we got few bakeries, we got many trains destroyed with food, but thanks God there was never life involved. At the end of the day, I kept asking myself, why are we here when we are losing lives? And the question, uh, the answer to the question by the fellow Ukrainians, we put a team of almost 5,000 Ukrainians with World Central Kitchen, where every dollar was going used to help pay the restaurants so the restaurants could pay the teams, buying the food locally so the food could help the farmers that at that point nobody was buying fruit from. In the process of aiding, we were helping the local economy somehow maintain itself. That's the way we do it. Right now we are in Armenia, where is uh, another war. Um, we are right now, uh, as soon as Hamas did the crazy attack against Israel, um, we began feeding in Israel. At the same time, we began feeding inside Gaza because we were already there before and we have a great partner called Anera, who they are medical, but because they know Gaza so well, we use their know-how of Gaza to do what we know, which is food. We were better because they make us better and in the way we make them better. Inside Gaza, we've done close to 1.4 million meals, even when you're reading that food cannot get in. We are in Jordan, we are in Egypt, we are in Lebanon. Uh, right now we are in uh, Acapulco in Mexico after this crazy hurricane category five with helicopters trying to reach every community that is totally uh, um, um, distance from any aid arriving because uh, the harms that this category five has done. I cannot believe that now we are able to be in seven, eight missions at the same time when we are still a very small organization of 800 people. Why we do that? Because we allow people to help us. And we are able to increase the number of people that are part of our organization all the time. And now is the gift that keeps on giving. Communities that we helped before, every time something happens in another country, Usually we have five, 10, 20 people that want to come to help this other country. Why? Because before we were there helping them. So now they are here helping them and them help them. And at the end what you see, humanity at best. In the worst moments of humanity, the best of humanity shows up. That's unfortunately the beauty of these moments. I want to try to do two things. We've had this conversation before, so I know it's safe. But one is, um, <laughs> but it's but it's not without controversy. Do, do I have, is, is any lawyer that can represent me? <laughs> one is to give you an opportunity to talk about the future of World Central Kitchen, if you want to do that. But there's a, let me just let's just have this little. Let me give you an opportunity to talk about this. A third of a just to talk about the United States. A third of Americans 
would be completely broke if they had an emergency that cost them more than $400. 10% of homeless people are homeless as a result of natural disasters, Katrina, hurricanes, earthquakes, etc. cetera. Um, the work that you're doing is amazing. Everybody here agrees about this. But doesn't it point to a gaping hole in the work that the federal government, et cetera, ought to be doing? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you, you're right about that. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you if I don't tell you that all of these, and especially the last 14 years, has been... Uh, you know, a big burden uh, on the shoulders of many. Now, I'm going to be a little bit selfish, but because you are kind of here listening to us, to me, and this looks like a confession. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you a rabbi? <laughs> In a Methodist church? That's cool. But, but you know, uh, I, I feel the burden, right? Uh, and the burden sometimes is a way that can be... Uh, I'm very sure all of you have a burden. And I have a feeling as we grow older, it's part of life. We feel the burden, right? Because we, we feel responsible. Uh, responsibilities are genuinely ours, or responsibilities we do take on our own. And I have a feeling we are all here to try to lift up the burden out of each other. And it's okay to recognize we feel, I don't know, call it whatever. You need to go to the psychologist, or you need to talk to God, or you need to talk to your mirror. But I feel that, I feel that burden. But we need to make sure that that burden is not what brings us down, but it's a burden that actually lifts us up. To understand that we are not alone, I'm not alone, but I'm surrounded by people that believe, like I do, that we can do better if we come together. I saw it when I was in the ship as a young Navy boy dreaming of an amazing world I wanted to be part of. When we were 300 crew, that that's a matter where the wind came from or the waves or the currents because we were working together as one. That's a matter of who we were, what religion we were, what, even we were all Spanish people, probably all Christian and Catholic, not necessarily churchgoers, but nonetheless. <laughs> that there still was 300 people from different parts of life that we were together with one mission to take that boat to safe port. And that's at the end what life needs to be. Call it politics, call it society, call it government, call it our cities, call it our families. What do all we do to make sure that our burden actually becomes the wind behind the cells? What do we all do to make sure that our burden can always be shared so the weight is not so heavy? And how can we make that the burden is actually what gives us the purpose to serve in our families, in our work, in our society, in our community, in our country? We can be finger pointing all day we want to the problems to everybody else. Or we can use this same finger and stop finger pointing and say, I'm here. I'm here to join and to serve and to join forces to anybody that, like me, believe that together we, the people, will always do better. So it's true that sometimes we need to be asking our government for better at every level especially in emergencies, but at the end I realized that the government is not them versus us. We are the government. If things are not as we want them to be, let's just stop finger pointing at what they are not and let us be the change we want to see. Switch gears and talk about the cookbook. <laughs> How much time? Because they, ha they said we have a clock, but it's not, it's, it's no, a clock. It is what time it is. Ah, ah. <laughs> but oh, no, uh, someone will, some, don't worry. Let's no, I'm not worried. Because I've been trying to be precise and, yeah. in the answering. Because, you know, with my, lack, <laughs> with my lack of English, I use two or three more words to express myself. This is Jose. And that makes brief. it longer. <laughs> 
This is you being brief. Um, <laughs> but let's talk about the cookbook, because it's not a typical cookbook. The Ritz not a chefy cookbook. It's not a cookbook without a position. It's a cookbook with a position. It's an unusual book, a beautiful one, as I might add. Well, coming, coming from you, I mean, I, you said I want to make sure. Obviously, you see that my name is in the cover of the book. And, and that was never my intention, but the contrary. It's only that uh, an editorial these days <laughs> wants to have a name in the cover of the book because somebody has to take ownership of that book. But in a way, it's very unfair that my name is in the cover of that book. Because that book, and the purpose of why I thought we should be doing this book. You need to understand, I'm the founder of Old Sandra Kitchen, but, but not anymore. I used to be the chairman, and now they brought me down to be a board member. And I'm very afraid I'm about to be kicked out of being a board member. <laughs> and I hope I can keep being a volunteer. <laughs> but the idea of the book was simple. Um, as you said, um, this is not a cookbook, but this is a celebration of the people that under the most dire situations were able to do fascinating, magical things in the middle of darkness. And every one of those recipes are not really recipes. Every one of those recipes are people that made something happen used to feed fellow citizens. Where sometimes we will not have plates or forks, but we will have an amazing group of women that will make tamales. And where we didn't even have plates, but they still they will have an open fire that they could be making this masa dough and fill it up with chicken or anything else they got and make these amazing tamales, sometimes with banana leaves and sometimes with core husk. And all of a sudden, armies of those women that had those little places that sometimes we don't go because they look too informal and a side, not even a restaurant, shop on the side of the road. And we'll go and we'll go to fancy restaurants at the end of the day, those are the women that are feeding the cities and the countries in very remote, poor areas around the world. And we will go, yeah, you can, because who feeds the world is not cooks like us, it's really women like my mom and many others. Thanks God that women are in charge of feeding the world. If not, the world will be even more hungry. More needs to be done, so we empower them. But in this book, it's the stories of those women that we will be able to deliver tens of thousands of tamales, even when we didn't even have any organization going, but people were hungry. And we are not an organization that likes to plan, we are an organization that likes to adapt. And in this book, you're gonna see a lot of adaptation. The urgency of now is yesterday when you talk about food and water. And in that moment, even without napkins and plates and forks, we could have those thousands of tamales being delivered where you could grab this tamal given with love by one person to another, and you could be using use the leaf to grab the tamal and eat it in a very humble but powerful way. You're gonna find many stories like this, like the day I was in Haiti cooking beans, black beans. I'm from Spain and I was cooking the way we cook black beans in Spain. But it happens I was in Haiti. And people don't want our pity, people want our respect. And to give respect so much, uh, to give respect is so easy. I mean, it's so simple. I, I, I always want to call President Trump to tell him, it's so easy to give respect to fellow citizens. I'm not trying to make it political, just realistic and pragmatic. To give respect even with people you don't know or you disagree with, or even you don't share religion or way of seeing life. Respect is something so simple to give. Those women were coming to me to tell me, they would say, thank you for cooking for us and, and, and providing the food. And, but hey man, we, Jose, we, <laughs> six hours cooking and, and they all come to me and hey, we don't want to be disrespectful, but we don't like the wings, the way you cook them. <laughs>
And in that moment, I realized the power of listening. Not the white boy mentality, this is what you need, people. But the new mentality that we should all believe on, on listening to the people that want our help. And that day, <laughs> singing beautiful Hessian songs, it took two more hours, but they made the beans into this amazing puree. We passed them through a sheaf out of some rice sacks of USID. And at the end, they did this amazing velvety, silky, shiny, beautiful black beans sauce that they love to eat next to their white rice. And if they're lucky, a piece of meat or fish next to it. And to me, that's the moment I understood the power of listening. Um, listening to change the world. Listening to give dignity. And this is, in a way, something like I know, it's a story that keeps going through Wall Central Kitchen. And in a way, this is a book to celebrate those men and women, to celebrate the thousands and tens of thousands that by now they've been part of working with Wall Central Kitchen, even if it was only for a day. And in a way, this is a book that I know is going to capture and make more people join our simple efforts, well through Wall Central Kitchen, or through new efforts at the grassroots that will happen in every corner of the world. I found the other day a letter from Clara Barton. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to buy it because it's expensive like hell. But it's a letter that she was writing to a friend and she was just wondering and mentioning after she retired from the American Red Cross, she found it. She was wondering if she was supposed to write a book to make sure <laughs> that what they achieved at the early days of the Red Cross will forever be remembered. Uh, I only l laugh and, and I thought about it because in a way that's what I only try to do with this book and a couple of other books we've been doing. Uh, to make sure that we share the story for, for every person that makes World Central Kitchen possible that is far away beyond whatever I did. World Central Kitchen exists because it's an army of people of goodness that they want to be part of the solution and not use a staying home like I did in Katrina. That's why this book exists. And that's why this book uh, that is being written, written by Sam, a uh, good friend who is a great writer, spent hours and hours and days and months listening from the people, their stories. And in a way, he put into the book the voices of all those people. That you see my name in the cover of the book is deceiving. This is a book of we, the people, of every corner around the world where World Central Kitchen has been in action. It's not my book. It's a book of the people. I'm done. We're going to take questions from the audience. Right, we have about 10 minutes to take some questions. We have someone in the balcony as well, so please raise your hand and we will try to get to you as soon as we can. All right, if I could have a, oh, I see one in the back here. Here we go. <laughs> right, if we could so pass well this down. Thank you. Hi, Chef. <laughs> um, quick question about the World Central. Do you guys, because I know you talked about it with the DC group, you handled um, using food waste and to feed people. Is that something that you incorporate as well? Yeah, okay, so you're asking DC Central Kitchen uh, versus Wall Central Kitchen. Yes. Okay, we, we, we need to rephrase food waste because I think it's a terrible name, but that's what we all call it, right? Food waste. I mean, um, you know, by food waste, we, sometimes is, we saw it during the pandemic. You, you know those apples that sometimes they have a little dark mark? Yeah. And <laughs> those apples are put aside, but those, are, those apples are beautiful too. That's food waste, right? Uh, carrots that they don't look perfect and equal one to each other. And the carrots are looking, hey, I'm different than you. Yeah, what's wrong with you? Nothing. I'm beautiful. Why? Because I'm different. It's a lot of that, right? 
in World Central Kitchen, um, uh, very often, uh, what was that? Uh, yeah, it was in Florida in the last uh, hurricane last year near Fort Myer and Tampa. And was this island uh, near Sanibel? Paradise Island? No, but. Ah? Captiva, all those islands. And there are very big farming community there. So we landed by helicopter within the first 12 hours, and those communities were really affected. We didn't bring any fresh fruit because we were able to be buying from the local farmers. The issue is that the local farmers didn't even want our money at the beginning. They said, no, no, we give you all the avocados. We give you all the grapefruit. We give you all the... And that's why in the middle, 12 hours after a hurricane, we were able to be delivering use fresh fruit and vegetables to families that maybe still could cook at home. But uh, in, in emergencies, yes, we always try. In Ukraine, at the beginning, we were bringing a lot of food from outside uh, Ukraine. Why? Because the factories were all closed. The supermarkets were all closed. Why they were all closed? Because 10 million people were moving away. It's not like Ukraine needed food. What Ukraine needed was infrastructure. We don't really cook. What we do is create systems of distribution. In the Bahamas, when Dorian Category 5 hit the northern part of Bahamas, we were there within hours when still the hurricane was north. We were bringing all the food through uh, and from Nassau because all the islands, 14 islands we were feeding, they had nothing. Why? Because the islands were under, literally underwater. But anything we could be buying that anybody will be able to produce, even we understand that islands don't export <laughs> a lot of food, they are net importers of food. But if we could be doing the effort of supporting the local farmers, buying from them anything they had, we would. Happen in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, we work with a lot of farmers that anytime it's been an earthquake or another hurricane, they know that we are the first organization they can come to because we will buy from them. It's smart, it's logical, you support the local economy. In the process of providing relief, you are already injecting money into families and businesses that they need all the help they can get. That's why I've always been very against sending MREs meals ready to eat. Because the meals ready to eat, besides they're bulky and expensive and they come from far away, they don't really resolve any problem even sometimes maybe that some people benefit from it. In, in a nation, especially in America, I mean, do you know how many restaurants are in the world? Tens and hundreds, millions, and warehouses of food. What I'm always saying is that food is always there. Let's try to, that we put the food and the people locally to start doing the quickest, fast relief we can helping the local economy at the process that we are trying to solve the short-term problems. I do believe this is the way. We have a question in the balcony. Hi, Chef. World Central Kitchen is known so well for all the incredible relief you've provided in disasters, natural and war-oriented. I have a question about political economic disasters, like the one that we're experiencing in Chicago right now with refugees coming to Chicago and not having the support. And I'm curious about whether the city has approached World Central Kitchen or whether World Central Kitchen might be a resource to cities like Chicago and New York where we're not used to how to help all these refugees that are coming to us. Yeah, okay. I, I'm, not, I'm not running for office yet. <laughs> but in case I do, I'm gonna be measured on the assessment. One of the issues we need to do, obviously, is what Chicago and any other city is doing right now to take care of those people. 
Uh, wall central kitchen, we need to be careful because we, we decided that we want to be pure emergency. In places we believe use money is not enough to provide food solutions, but the creativity and the adaptation of the people to achieve it. And we've done this when Afghanistan, in the last days of the American presence in Afghanistan, thousands of Afghan refugees were arriving to different airports around the world, and World Central Kitchen was in many of those airports in America and some places around the world, providing the first meals that those families were receiving as other places and other conflicts. Uh, a few, a couple of years ago, was 5,000 Haitians in a bridge in Texas that was all over the news. And we received a phone call, but World Central Kitchen was there already before even we got the phone call, helping feed those refugees in the border. But I'm not gonna be getting into Chicago or New York or San Francisco on every other big city that right now they're having an influx of those refugees. This is actually not only happening in America, but this is happening in Europe. This is happening, unfortunately, in many parts of the world. But let me tell you why it's very important that we, as the people, as our leaders, to be smart on the policies, that we, they move forward to try to make America a better country for all. When America in 2010 gave food for free to Haiti, through the USDA programs where in disasters, America, because has a big production of food, the government buys from the farmers, and that food is always put at the service of helping fight famine around the world. This is a good feeling. As Americans, Republicans, Democrats, independents, everybody should feel good. We are helping people that are hungry around the planet. But doing good is not good enough anymore. Because when we give the crumbs and the extra production of the rich countries to the poor countries for many weeks, months, and sometimes over a year or two, what we do is we create a total disaster in the local economies that they heavily rely on farming outputs because the vast majority of the people in those countries work out of farms in rural areas. When you give so much food for free to rural poor countries around the world in emergencies, you put every single farmer in those countries out of business because during weeks or months, nobody is buying anything from them. Therefore, the feeling good of the rich countries, Europe, Australia, America, Canada, is only good to a degree. Let me go 14 years later, I mentioned the Haitians. Right now we have a very big issue on the border. When we have refugees, is why? <laughs> because they don't have jobs, because they don't have hope, because they don't have democracy. We could argue, yeah, but America cannot take them all. Europe cannot take them all. Okay, fine. Let me say for a second I agree in a percentage with that assessment. But what's the role? Changing the policies that are smarter. Instead of sending them food for free that puts farmers out of business, send them money or know-how to make those farmers productive enough that they can feed the people that need to be fed in those countries. We're trying to help in the process, helping those poor economies to grow. Why we had 5,000 Haitians and more in the southern border of the United States? Because 14 years later, I guarantee you, because I've been there, that many of those people were the same farmers that we put out of business, that then the only thing they're trying to do is fit. So if I'm a senator from a rural estate in America, and I want to support my farmers, you will say, and that's why politics is so complicated, and we need politicians that they are pragmatic. That's a matter of what party, that they will support that aid is given in the form of food. Still, they could tell the farmers to share know-how. This way, what you cannot do is complaining that we have refugees in the southern border that you don't want in your country, when actually were the policies you supported in the first place, the ones that put those and refugees out of business. <laughs> this way, we don't have to take care of what's happening in Chicago. 
because people don't want to leave their homes. I know that. People don't want to come to bother you in the same way you don't want to bother them. People want to live prosperous life in the places they live. That's why I always say I don't believe in walls. I believe in longer tables. I think the wealthy countries have to share know-how and systems with poorer countries. If I'm talking mainly America, I can say the same about Europe as a European. The best interest of America at the national security level is make sure that every country surrounding America does as well as we do. That we invest in those countries in the lives of, the, of their people, of their children. What I want for my daughters is what I want for the daughters of others that I don't know. If we create a wealth around the countries surrounding America, all of a sudden America itself would not be having a refugee crisis. That's why food policy today is more important than ever. That's why I'm asking that we need a national security food advisor next to the president. That's why I'm asking that we need to have a secretary of food. And that's why I do believe food very much is part of many of the problems. When people are becoming refugees, it's because they are hungry and they cannot feed their people. That's why we have refugees in the first place. Let's make sure that countries like America, that as you know I love, brings the idea of democracy, the idea of economic growth, the idea of investing in others, to make sure that we build once and for all longer tables, stop this nonsense of building higher walls, because walls are only creating a wall that is worse, not better. Right. This will be our final question for the evening. Oh, wonderful. Un gran placer conocerte. I, I, I am strangely um, <laughs> without words, which doesn't happen to me too often. Um, I would like to build on what whoever that was in the balcony said um, and perhaps um, encourage you to write your next book, which I think should be what you just said. Um, to teach politicians and, and policymakers how to cut through all this logistical red tape and analysis paralysis and just do something. Um, because I think it, it sounds like in the 14 years that you've been doing that, your team, your organization has really gotten very good at it. And I think that's what they need to hear. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you, but uh, we, we're still learning. Um, but, but what we're doing is, is going back. Uh, I remember I was 26 years old, and I think it was 1996, 1997, that one bill was passed. That was the Good Samaritan Bill. The Good Samaritan Bill was a very simple bill that was protecting individuals and companies from donating food in goodwill and being sued by third parties. This was a great initiative by President Clinton, that Secretary Glickman, and I was there as my restaurant was donating food to This Is Andra Kitchen into the truck, and we were in a way celebrating what that bill was achieving. I was also a very young boy when I saw a hunger caucus happening at This Is Andra Kitchen. Few senators from both parties, 10 of them I think, came to this central kitchen, and they spoke about how to solve the hunger issue in America. This is what planted the seed in me, understanding that we need grassroots organizations that especially that are successful, that then we can bring those successes to the big top powers of our cities, our states, and our government, to really emphasize to those people creating the bills that that's the type of bills and support we need to keep giving power to those grassroots organizations showing us the way. Um, at the end, it's very simple things that everybody should be agreeing. Um, I remember during the President Biden campaign, um, running for president, he invited me to do a town hall. Remember, it was COVID times, there was no gatherings like this, and I guess I was the lucky one, and I did a town hall with President Biden. And the, Town Hall was about food. 
I think it's the first time in the history that a candidate for president does a town hall where the main issue is food. Many things happen on this administration. The last food conference ever to happen, first one ever happened in America was in 1969 under President Nixon. Certain amazing ideas like wigs and snaps came out of that conference in 1969. But the world has changed dramatically. No other conference has ever happened at the highest level of government to try to keep building on the things that work, uh, improving the things that work, and adding few new ideas that can make the entire system, I'm talking only America, better. Thanks to the support of Susan Rice and obviously President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, a food conference happened last year, which was the second food conference in 52 years where more ideas kept. I'm a big believer that we need, obviously, not just put pressure that government has to come with all, but it's the role of all of us to showcase, like this is Central Kitchen, like other organizations here in Chicago, in San Francisco, in Miami, or that proof concept. Uh, the other day I got the news of this is Central Kitchen began in Washington, D.C., at the other side of the river, a place that doesn't even look like belong to Washington, D.C., but that is the real Washington, on the other side of the Anacostia River, uh, mainly a big uh, Afro-American population, more Washingtonians than me, that is food desert. If I was the President of the United States tomorrow, I would make mandatory that in one year we will have no more food deserts in America, period. That's something the federal government can do. If I was President, I will announce that we will have universal breakfast and a school lunch to every children in America. That's something like every American I speak to agrees to. Things like this start building really a sense that food is not an issue, but actually an opportunity. I will increase SNAP, and I will make sure that the SNAP can be used also in the local food trucks and in the local diners, because usually the people that receive SNAPs in the place they live is so poor that they cannot use that SNAP money in their own community. And the SNAP should be making their communities richer, not poorer. It's a whole bunch of ideas and things that I know is very smart people. I'm speaking about Mr. Marvin Mangiri is an expert on many of those issues himself. The only thing I can tell you is that as one more American from the day I arrived to Washington DC as 23 years old boy, besides the time I spent in my restaurants, that some food critics sometimes tell me I don't spend enough, and they're right, but <laughs> I try to spend time with boots on the ground, not to listen what the problems are, but on my own to understand what the problems that we face, why they happen, and how we can fix them. I'm hopeful that there is a true movement in America of people that they want to stop use finger pointing on the problem, but the Americans that really want to be part of the solution. World Central Kitchen has shown me that, yes, we can do in emergencies, this in America and around the world. But right now, it's a real true movement. It's how we make the richest country in the world to make sure that this is a country one day we can announce is not one person hungry and is not one person poor. This should be an objective that we should all believe that should not be something like looks like an impossible dream, but something like you and I, we can see in our lifetimes. I don't know if we will succeed, but I'm only telling you that I am one more American committed to make sure that in America and in the world will not be a child that will go bed hungry, a person that will not see the future we hope because nobody seems to remember who they are. Food could be the answer to solve many of the problems we have. Let's make it happen.